So getting back to our discussion regarding the operating systems, the LTs have an advantage over most of the other engines. We're not running speed density, we have additional sensors like humidity sensors, we have a proper airflow meter, we have a pre-supercharger MAP sensor or manifold absolute pressure sensor, we have a post-supercharger MAP sensor. So we know the intake pressure before and after the supercharger, we know the intake air temperature, we know the air humidity, we know the airflow rate. All this combined with a two or three bar operating system that was written properly by the manufacturer means that this engine performs virtually identical to its normally aspirated counterpart, except it has a lot more horsepower. The LT1 is rated at about 460 horsepower. I do believe this LT4 is rated at about 660 horsepower. So we're talking an additional 200 horsepower. But the beauty of a supercharger is you basically get the same drivability, the same characteristics of the engine it's built on until it gets into boost. And once it gets into boost, then of course you have that additional power. And let me just say that these engines are built from the ground up to be supercharged. So not only are the internals stronger, but the engine is designed around the flow of the supercharger, the forced induction. So we have stronger parts, we have a compression ratio that was lowered over the production engine. We've added about 9.7 pounds of boost in the supercharger. There's different liter displacement superchargers. Now again, I think we have to revisit the fact that these engines are production engines put on the street running pump gas. And if you talk to most of the guys out there, these LT4s and LT5s are running very consistent at their rated horsepower ratings. In fact, my sources at GM say that these engines are putting out more horsepower than they're rated at. We're doing a lot to keep this engine cool. First, of course, we have our 52 millimeter radiator, and I wanna talk about that a second. Our 52 millimeter radiator now has dual headers. What that means is where the tube goes into the header, it is supported by two separate headers. We learned this from tractor technology years ago. It was somewhat costly and difficult to implement, but we've done it. And the reason is JK's flex, aluminum doesn't. Aluminum is brittle. It's not like plastic aluminum radiators where they're crimped together with rubber seals. Those radiators can flex with the JK and get away with it, but the aluminum radiators don't, they just crack. So over the years, we've used all the manufacturer's radiators, and we've ended up designing our own radiator with a dual header. And of course, this vehicle's running that, that radiator. We're running a Camaro SS fan, which is pretty much top of the line. It can pull a lot of CFM. We are running a intercooler, a rather large intercooler. We're running a AC condenser to keep the air conditioning cool. We are running a transmission cooler behind the bumper. We are running a additional transmission cooler on the right side rock rail. We are running an engine oil cooler on the left side rock rail. So you can see we got a lot of cooling going on here. We're cooling the intake air. We're cooling the engine coolant. We're cooling the transmission fluid. We're cooling the engine oil. And by ganging all this together, that means that we have a vehicle that's gonna run cool at high altitude or out here in the desert when summer comes around and it's well over 100 degrees. What we found was we could keep putting bigger radiators in, but if the transmission started running hot, between that and the AC condenser, they would just transfer that heat into the radiator and you're back to square one. So by off-boarding some of these coolers, and high-performance vehicle manufacturers have been doing this for years. You look at some of the Bugattis and Lamborghinis, they got multiple radiators everywhere. So that's exactly what we've done. And this is included in our LT4 build. Let's talk a little bit about this JK. This is an early model JK, and I'm gonna say this JK is tight. We got Dynatrack one-ton axles. We've got PSC hydraulic power steering. We've got an Atlas II. We have a GM Performance LT4 crate engine, which is essentially the same as a production Corvette crate engine. We have a production 8L90 transmission. We're running all stock GM modules and software, so we're running a E92 with a 2018 or 19, I don't remember, operating system. We're running a T87 transmission control module. The software has been completely flashed by GM, TIS, or technical information system, technical delivery system, service programming system, whatever you want to call it. It's the factory GM software. This vehicle does have a Cadillac CTSV tune in it and it runs excellent. A lot of guys say, well, that's not a four-wheel drive tune, but you gotta remember that this transmission has multiple vehicle speed sensors built into it, including an output shaft speed sensor or an OSS. So we don't really need a vehicle speed sensor B behind the transfer case. Yes, we could add that, but these engines run really good off-road. Moving on to the intercooler, we're running the factory intercooler pump, 
and it is controlled by the operating system so I can see it wind up with intake air temperature. I looked at a couple of different online intercooler routing systems and we've done some builds before but what I settled on was our own way of doing this. We've fitted a relatively large intercooler in front of the AC condenser. We mounted the intercooler pump on the driver's side fender well right next to the radiator. We then have the coolant from the intercooler system, not from the engine coolant system, going into this pump. And it's a scroll pump, so it goes into the middle, centrifugally so flies out, comes out the other side, pushed through the intercooler water to air system. Now, this is a water to air system, it's not an air to air. Some of you guys see the air to air systems, and that requires large piping and large intercoolers to transfer the air to air, hot air to the cool air. I do believe that the water cool systems are superior. We can transfer more heat. We have more control using the water pump. There is a heat exchanger inside the intake manifold. It's kept compact. In fact, this LT4 engine has got an intake manifold that's lower than the truck engines like the LED3 and the LED6. So it's a very compact, very powerful system, and it moves a lot of heat. So here we have a fully integrated, multi-bar, supercharged, LT direct injected, continuous variable valve timing, engine <laughs> that's a lot it's funny how I get criticized sometimes why are you wasting that powertrain in a Jeep I don't think these hot rodders really understand us Jeepers and I'm both I grew up on hot rods and I grew up on Jeep so putting the two together was natural for me I've been there with 3.8 Jeeps struggling to hold 40 50 miles an hour up some of these grade I personally like the way the V8 runs much better off-road you can throw the thing into four high put the transmission into drive and go. There is no shifting. You don't gotta worry about going up hills or down hills. You got better compression braking. It's just a much better driving experience. And every time I get into my Jeep, I gotta smile. I can throw my family into it. I can hit the highway. I can go 80 miles an hour in Utah or Texas with no worries. Most of my customers are from about 35 to dead. That's the age group. And I don't think they're out there like, like high schoolers drag racing on Van Nuys Boulevard. And yeah, I did that. San Fernando Road, Van Nuys Boulevard, etc. I think these guys just want something that's technologically superior. They want something that's state of the art. They want something that makes them smile when they drive it. At the end of the day, in an internal combustion engine, what moves your vehicle down the road is how much cylinder pressure you have. How much is pushing down on that piston and the surface area of that piston. So if we were to use a external combustion engine as an example, let's take a steam engine. The power that that steam engine puts out is directly related to how much pressure the boil puts into the engine. So if you've got a boil putting out 50 PSI versus one that's putting out 100 PSI, the 100 PSI is going to push the piston down and up. Most steam engines push the piston both up and down. So a two-cylinder steam engine is like a four-cylinder internal combustion engine. So you're pretty much unlimited. The more steam pressure you put in, superheated steam, whatever, the more power you're gonna have. Internal combustion engines are a little bit different. We have what's called the static compression ratio. So if the piston goes up, it squeezes the air into the combustion chamber. Now here's the problem. At sea level, that is one value, but at 10 or 11,000 feet, that's another value. Taking it further, if you're in an airplane at 30,000 feet, then that's dramatically less. Basically, the atmosphere is a column of air pushing down on the Earth. When we talk about vacuum, we're actually talking about negative pressure because up in space, it's pure vacuum. There is no atmosphere. So if you're at sea level, you have a giant column of air pushing down, which is creating more dense air. Atmospheric pressure is about one bar or 14.7 PSI. That's what holds us together. So as you move up in that column of air, the less dense or the lower the air density is of the air around you. That means there's less air for the engine to breathe, less oxygen. Remember, what you're mainly breathing right now is nitrogen, about 79%, and about 21% oxygen. Oxygen is a catalyzer, part of the fire triangle. You need heat, fuel, and air, or oxygen. So as you go up in altitude, basically there's less air. Now if we take a normally aspirated engine that runs basically at one bar, you're gonna be pulling about 20 inches of vacuum at idle, and wide open throttle, that's gonna drop down to about zero, so it's gonna match atmospheric. That's the most power that engine's gonna put out. That's also the most efficient that engine's gonna be at wide open throttle. So how do we compensate for less air at altitude? Well, there's several ways to do it. We've been doing it for a long time. Obviously, one is supercharging. Forced induction, whether it's supercharging or turbocharging, essentially crams more air into an internal combustion engine. 
Manufacturers have been looking for ways to get better economy and better performance, and there's two directions they've gone in. One is to take a small engine and make it act like a big engine, and the other is to take a big engine and make it act like a small engine. So if we look at the V8s like the Hemis, the LSs, the LTs, they use something called multiple displacement technology. It might be called active fuel management, displacement on demand, whatever you want to call it. Larger engines are less efficient under low loads and at part throttle. And the reason is because of pumping losses. When you throttle an engine or you put a throttle body on it and you choke the engine off, vacuum is created when those pistons come down. We have a four cycle engine here. So we've got to fight that vacuum and that's a pretty big force. Now they've known this for a lot of years and way back in the 80s they actually came out with some multiple displacement vehicles like the Cadillac 468. But essentially, by dropping cylinders out, by stopping the valves from moving, we can regain some of that pumping loss by turning that cylinder into an air spring. So while we're compressing the air on the way up, and there is no fuel because we've shut that injector off, that same pressure will push the piston back down, so we retrieve a lot of the lost energy. With this technology, and most manufacturers have now gone to it, we can take a larger displacement engine, like a 6-liter engine, and make it act more like a 3-liter engine. And I'm a big fan of that because once you do get under a load, you have a heavy JK, you have a heavy truck, the larger displacement engine then has efficiencies over the smaller displacement engine. And we're not just talking about longevity and reliability, but having more cubic inches means it can more efficiently and effectively move the vehicle down the road without having power adders like superchargers or turbochargers. So if we look at the flip side, the Europeans have been using turbochargers for a lot of years. There's some superchargers out there, but not, not as many. And what they're trying to do is make a smaller displacement engine act like a larger displacement engine. So you take a two liter engine and you put a turbo on it. Now remember my theory that there is no replacement for displacement, and there's not. Can you get power out of a turbocharger? Sure, you can get a lot of horsepower out of a turbocharger. But what we're essentially doing is we're taking a small displacement engine and we're trying to make it act like a bigger one and gain the efficiencies that the larger displacement engine has. And they actually can do that. So you might be a fan of the smaller engines with turbos, or you might be a fan of the larger V8 normally aspirated engines like the V8 muscle cars have been for decades. And I'm in that boat because there's nothing like the sound and the torque and the linear throttle response of a proper V8 engine. Not only that, when you have a high stressed small engine versus a low stressed large engine, things like longevity come into play. When you got a 6.2 liter engine just putting along at 1800 RPM on the highway all day versus a small turbocharged or small displacement engine revving up three, four, five thousand RPM. The lifespan of low stressed engine is obviously going to be longer than the smaller high stressed engine. So now we have our supercharger on our engine, whether it's a small or a large displacement engine, and we're going to force air in at above atmospheric. And it doesn't really matter what atmospheric is, it's about 100 kPa or kilopascals at sea level. Now we say, well, we want more horsepower because we're going to go drag race, or we want more horsepower because we're going to operate this vehicle at high altitude. What do we do? So we put a blower on it, we put a turbo on it. And I can tell you in the early days, back in the 70s and 80s, I did some work with Gail May. We didn't have the technology and the computers that we have today. We didn't have the safety systems that we have today. So we'd throw a blower on, we'd have a mechanical wastegate. We didn't really have computers to tune, we were using carburetors, so the results were mixed. You can get a lot of horsepower, pretty much as much as you wanted out of a forced induction system. But we always had drivability issues. When we went from normally aspirated into boost, there would be a hesitation. Cruise control systems didn't like it. Now that we do have computer control systems, they're very sensitive to atmospheric pressure. We have what's called barometric sensors and manifold absolute or MAP sensors. Barometric sensors and manifold absolute pressure sensors tell the operating system what atmospheric pressure is and what intake manifold vacuum is. And by using this information and combining it with other parameters like RPM, we can actually determine load. Now, if you don't have an airflow meter like a mass airflow sensor, then you're running under what's called speed density. And most Chrysler operating systems run off speed density. One step above that would be the airflow meter. And there's been different kind of airflow meters. Uh, you probably remember the old vane type that was mechanical and as the air came in, it would move a little vane and that would then send a signal to the computer. But today, pretty much everything is a hot wire. They pump current into a wire and they try to keep it at a constant temperature. And the more current they have to pump in, the more airflow there is. And modern math sensors are very reliable. In the old days, they weren't. In the early days, they were very expensive because of metals they used in the wire. The wire would get dirty, they had burn-off relays, they would burn the contamination off the wire, 
but today they pretty much got them dialed. I find that a properly tuned airflow operating system is the best. They just seem to have the best throttle response, the best economy, the best drivability. Not that a speed density system can't have excellent drivability, they're just not as versatile. If I were to go from where I'm at now to the top of that mountain rapidly, an airflow meter would give the computer more information to base its calculations off of versus lookup tables. And a while ago, most manufacturers eliminated barometric pressure sensors, which means we don't actually have a real-time reading of what atmospheric pressure is. Now, some systems still do run a separate barometric sensor and a map sensor. Most systems take a barrel reading or atmospheric pressure reading when you key up. When you key up, it registers that as, hey, we're at this altitude or we're at this air density. Then, when you start the engine up, obviously, we revert over to engine vacuum. And if you were to make wide altitude changes, during that ignition cycle, you can have some funny running. A lot of you guys with the pin stars probably know in Colorado, going from four to 12,000 feet in the same ignition cycle could cause your, your pin star engine to start whacking And out. a solution was manufacturers recommended shutting the vehicle off about every four or 5,000 feet, get a new barometric pressure reading, and then continue on. With an airflow meter, that's not as important. And what these LTs have done is added a humidity sensor because humidity obviously has a lot to do with, with the quality of the air going in your motor. So these LTs having a map before the blower, after the blower, a humidity sensor, an airflow meter, a intake air temp sensor have a lot of information going in to the computer or the ECU. What that means is if we have a proper operating system, we can operate this engine almost like it's normally aspirated. We can have linear throttle response right up through the transition between normally aspirated and boost. We can have perfect cruise control function. We can have drivability that virtually rivals any normally aspirated engine. And that's what we have here. What really bothers me with force induction engines, especially aftermarket installs, is drivability. Because a lot of the modern operating systems are based on torque management, which means it's not so much based on a program table like in the old days we had program fuel tables and then we had learns that would migrate the adaptives towards where we wanted. These vehicles are based on how much torque the engine's putting out and that determines your shifting strategy, your fuel delivery, your spark timing and a lot of other things. So now for example let's take a 3.6 JK. We have a speed density operating system which means we don't have an airflow meter we're looking at lookup tables we're basically looking at rpm and intake manifold vacuum to deliver our fuel and we're shifting the transmission based off of torque management so if we put a blower on that and this is a one bar operating system and i, I think i should qualify what a one bar operating system is when a manufacturer writes the operating system and the calibration remember the operating system is like windows 10 and the calibration is the program or the tune so that would be like Word or Excel. When they develop this software, it's all built around an engine that runs on atmosphere. It's kind pressure. of ridiculous how this thing pulls. Watch the speedometer. If you just want to get up to speed, we are on the freeway cruising along just under 2,000 RPM at about 65. You can see how docile this engine is. I can hear a little bit of engine noise, but mostly wind and tire. Let me show you a couple of things. Let's bring it back into sixth gear. Well, actually, let's activate cruise. So I'm in cruise control right now, just cruising along. I'm gonna bring it back into sixth gear. Now, we got a lot of passing power if we need it. And you can use that manual function to pass. If you're towing a trailer, you're going up or down a mountain grade. You can select whatever gear you want. And one of the beauties is, let's go ahead and set cruise control here. Once you're in cruise control, even if you shift, and I'm gonna drop a couple of gears, then I'm gonna shift up. And notice how we hold that miles per hour right on the nut. So you can upshift and downshift it in cruise control. And that I find very useful, like if I'm coming down the grade from Mount Charleston, I gotta drop into seventh, sixth, sometimes fifth to hold my speed back. So what I can do is I can set my cruise control at the speed limit, 55, and then I can upshift and downshift to control my speed. Now, the engine does try to hold the speed back, but it can only do so much with compression braking, and in a steep grade, especially with a trailer, you're gonna have to manually control that. We do have the option 
to shift through the cruise control lever if you choose both on the early JKs and the late JKs and yes you still maintain cruise and tap or tap and cruise which means you basically set your speed to whatever you want it to be then in drive then you pull it back into the manual gate and the cruise control will stay active and you can bump shift up and down so we have a lot of options there and that's all programmable by the user now I'm going to turn the cruise control off by just tapping on the brake rather than use the cruise lever it's all integrated exactly the same way it was from the factory a typical example by the way here's beautiful red rock covered in a little bit of snow got a vehicle going 40 miles an hour we're in eighth gear and we want to pass so we have to wait until we get into a passing lane situation now in a two lane road like this obviously there's a lot of qualifiers one you got to make sure there's traffic not coming the other way two you got to make sure that you're you have the right to pass which we don't right now three you got to make sure you have the power if you're going 65 70 miles an hour and you're going to try to pass you need a lot more power than if you're going 40 or 50. point being that with the v6 sometimes it's difficult to pass because you just don't have the power on these desert roads you don't know what's going to be coming up ahead so you want to be sure that you have enough momentum to get past that vehicle and safely back into the next lane we had a snowstorm up here brought the uh, snow level down to I'm going to say about 3,000 feet now you'll notice that I don't have to get back a quarter of a mile to build speed up to pass this guy I can literally wait until I see a clearing and I can see some vehicles coming so obviously this isn't a passing condition once these vehicles clear I have a passing lane maybe half throttle you know when you get up to altitude Gary I was on the top of the mountain there's no power loss and it stays in eighth gear well I, I, I cruise all the way up in eighth gear and even accelerated and it just stayed in eighth gear trailer to be back into this dry one. Yeah, it's pretty good at it though. Got my son a little toy for Christmas. It's a big rig with a trailer on it. I was practicing backing that thing up. So this is going to be our tune, Gary. If you feel it's just so mild. Oh, I like it. Cruise, tap shift. I did a little bit of tweaking on the uh, transmission to get it where I wanted it the boost now when you put it under a load gear you hear a kind of a raspy exhaust yeah. but it's only at that one point where the cam phases so it doesn't bother me a whole lot once you get it on the highway it's silent yeah if you go up over the axle that'll keeps it pulling to well over a hundred so the dichotomy of this engine is is it's just so mild so here we are in the snow with the LT4 listening to the Eagles what could be better it performed excellent on the mountain both times that I brought it out in fact like I mentioned earlier better than expected its power delivery is very controllable in fact you don't even know you have a blower one thing that's interesting is I put several hundred miles on this Jeep and the blower has got quieter as it's broken in it's barely audible until you get into the throttle now so you don't really know and by the way I'm in uh, tap shift right now so you can see both the aero force gauge and the dash is indicating second let's go up a gear notice that the dash said third before the aero force gauge because the dash is the commanded gear the aero force is the actual gear so there was that slight delay we are in four-wheel drive high i did not find four-wheel drive low necessary in fact in most instances you won't need four-wheel drive low where you used to use it with your v6 unless 
you're doing something technical, crawling up a really tall, tall mountain, going down a really tall mountain, where you need that really low wheel speed. But this engine has so much torque that you can pretty much modulate any amount of power out of it that you want. So we got several more LT4 builds going on in the shop, and of course we're gonna keep refining things. We did have to produce some custom bracketry and intake tubes and such intercooler mounts for this build and we will carry that over into the next builds which which means we'll be getting more and more efficient at this but right out of the box this LT4 has performed excellent and has really not had any issues to speak of usually when you pioneer something groundbreaking you run into some challenges but we really didn't in this one I think we did our homework I think we studied the wiring we studied the software the hardware has been rationalized pretty much with the LT ones and the other LTs so we didn't really run into a whole lot of uh, constraints with this one now where this combination is really gonna shine is gonna be at high altitude as most of you know Colorado and Washington State and some of these other areas where they have 10, 11, 12,000 foot mountains, your performance really drops off. The performance of this engine is phenomenal at sea level, but it's going to maintain most of that performance even at 10 or 12,000 feet, where pretty much any other normally aspirated engine is going to drop off. If you've got a 280, let's say 300 horsepower Pentstar, and you get up to 10,000 feet, you're going to be talking a 200 horsepower engine, you're going to lose a 30 year power. This engine has close to 700 horsepower and you're going to be maintaining, in my opinion, over 600 of that horsepower at altitude. They do run quite a bit of boost in these, they're 9.7 and they run a high static compression ratio of 10 to 1. Back in the day we used to drop the compression ratios down to 7, 8 to 1 to protect the lower end because if you're going to be pushing five, six, seven, eight pounds of boost into it, you need that lower compression so that you don't build up too much cylinder pressure. But these LTs were designed for cylinder pressure. And I think that's important because of the direct injection and the other technologies that allow these engines, including the continuous variable valve timing. And that's big. And I mentioned that a lot. And a lot of you guys don't really know what that means, but that means they can phase the camshaft anywhere they want and they can lower the cylinder pressure or raise the cylinder pressure. So that's what allows them to get away with these ultra high compression ratios on lower grade fuel, the combustion efficiency of the direct injection. So when we carry that over into a supercharger, what we have is a bottom end that's got forged internals that really was designed to be halfway to a diesel. Now diesels of course run higher compression ratios. However, for a gas motor, 11 and a half to one's a lot of compression ratio like in the LT1. But we're still pushing 10 to one in this one and we're running 9.7 pounds of boost. Most of you guys that have superchargers in your V6s know that if you put a five pound pulley on your supercharger, you get pretty good horsepower at lower altitude and the drivability is better because the more boost you put in, the more erratic or the more undrivable, or the more, let me just say, the more drivability you lose. So if you went from a five pound to a 10 pound pulley, you're gonna notice that the hesitations and the cruise control function and all that just gets funkier and funkier. So, with this engine, what we have at altitude is perfect drivability with a 9.7 pounds of boost. And 9.7 pounds of boost with a 10 to one static compression means that they can really rack up the cylinder pressure at high altitude when the air is thin. Because when the air is thin, a lot of you may even have issues breathing up at altitude if you have heart conditions. It's the same thing with your engine. You gotta pull that air in to get oxygen. Oxygen powers the world. It powers combustion and it powers your body. The blood carries oxygen throughout your body and distributes it and that's how you live. If you were to get CO poisoning, that's carbon monoxide poisoning. Essentially carbon monoxide, which is one carbon atom and one oxygen atom, is a replacement in your body for an oxygen atom. So if you're in a closed garage breathing CO, what you end up dying from is essentially blood poisoning because your bloodstream essentially circulates CO, which is inert compared to oxygen or pure oxygen, and that can't power your body, so your body shuts down. For example, if you take 
a cigarette, a lit cigarette, and you put it in a fish tank with inert gas, let's say you used argon, it would take forever if it even combusted at all, if it even burned at all. Then you take that same cigarette, light it, and fill that chamber with pure oxygen, and poof, that cigarette would go up in a matter Back of seconds. Back in LA, when I was working with some aerospace guys that would do exotic welding, we would have an inert chamber that we would weld magnesium and some other combustible metals in because exposed to oxygen, metals like magnesium can actually light off and have self-combustion. So what we have to look at at high altitude is there's less and less oxygen. And as an interesting side note, the higher you go up in altitude, the less and the less large bugs become. Because the way bugs work is they depend on oxygen to survive and there's less and less oxygen at altitude. So the higher you go, the less bugs you're going to see and the smaller they're going to go to the rainforest in Brazil versus Mount Everest you're going to see a significant difference in the size of the bugs now here's the best part about this LT4 that I really find awesome well actually guys I got to get out and unlock these hubs um, so let's do that so first thing I'm going to do guys is I'm going to take this thing out of four-wheel drive now you can see both levers are forward which basically means that we are in four high if they were both back that would be four low so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start rolling really slow throw it in neutral and I'm gonna pull this lever back now we're in neutral in the front and what that's gonna do is it's gonna release the tension on the front axle so when we come out now and an unfortunate side effect of test drives in the snow is mud but it'll wash off okay so now we're gonna unlock the hubs And I will say, I like the way these new Dynatrax unlock. I recently had the need for four wheel drive and another axle and they make you use a tool to unlock the hubs, which is very inconvenient on the trail. And if you don't have the tool, you could be screwed. So here we are back in rear wheel drive high. We're gonna go back into drive. Now, if you look at the aero force gauge, it's showing first gear, but the dash is showing drive. And the reason is the dash is showing, again, the commanded gear, aero force is showing current gear. So when we get on this highway, you're gonna see that change. And what I was saying a little bit earlier about the LT4 is once you do get on the highway, it's a dream. So watch that aero force gauge kick up. And you'll really rack through these gears under a light load because this eight speed wants to get in top gear so here we are now in top gear about 1300 rpm and now our drivability is perfect what i'll do is i'm going to bring this down into six and watch how this cruise holds the speed notice how an rpm match shift rev the motor up and we're holding within one mile an hour bring it back we're going to rack it right back up into eighth and we didn't even deviate one mile an hour. So what we have here is an engine that has near 700 horsepower with perfect drivability, can operate in hostile conditions. And what I mean by that would be high altitude, off-road trails where you have mud and snow. It's not like a turbocharger where you have to worry about those turbo pipes getting hot and wrapping them and protecting them. The supercharger is actually built inside of the manifold. An engine that gets pretty decent economy probably is going to be emissions legal wherever you're at. It just has a whole bunch of benefits.